Hello! Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure with me, Thomas Dinas. This is the Delicious Legacy podcast where we dive in deep into the past to explore forgotten foods and the history of uh, ingredients throughout the world. On today's episode, we're going to check a delicious nut, a popular ingredient as a snack or as part of desserts or or savory dishes, the pistachio. Where is it from? How did it spread around the world? And why the Sicilian one is the best? Before we go to our episode, let me remind you that this podcast can only exist with your generous support. So please go to Patreon and from $2 a month, become a member of the Delicious Legacy and uh, get yourself not only the podcasts ad-free and early, but a wealth of... Uh, Recipes, engine musings, and articles, and interesting thoughts, uh, and other unique um, writings from me and uh, from the ancient world as well. I'm also making some videos, so check them out on YouTube. And please leave um, a review and a rating wherever you get your podcasts from, either Spotify or YouTube or Acast or Apple Podcasts or Amazon and so on and so on. Right, let's go to our episode. Wherever the wind blows. Your pistachio tree will pollinate then. Pistachia are wind-pollinated plants. Of course, this is less effective and, of course, much less controllable way of um, pollinating a tree compared to the pollination by bees. It is riskier as well. Depends on which way the wind blows and where are your... Female trees. To further complicate matters, male pistachio trees can sometimes be out of sync with the female ones, blooming up to a full month ahead of the females. And there's only a handful of days that female trees are in bloom. Pistachios are the only dioecious tree nut, which is to say it has a female and female tree. Whether wild in a forest or cultivated in an orchard, the optimal male-to-female ratio is 1 to between 10 and 12. In the man-made orchards, farmers have to pollinate the trees artificially, something that people in ancient Mesopotamia seem to have figured out many thousands of years ago. We get these clues from examples like a 9th century BCE, a Syrian bas-relief of winged genies shaking a cone over a flowering tree, all the way to historian Strabo on his 1st century BC description of people hand-pollinating dates. This brings the question, how did people first get the idea to take a male flower and shake it over the female ones in order to pollinate them? Regardless when that happened, it is a genius idea. However, humans could only do that once they had a forest or an orchard of pistachia vera. The first appearance of the pistachio we know and love today came about randomly. Pistachios do not reproduce true to type. For example, plant a peach, an apricot or a lemon seed and you'll get a plant with the same characteristics as that of the parent plant. Not so with many other fruits, including most apples, cherries and pears. And of course, our subject today, pistachios. Then humans intervened. Scientists believe an ancient farmer or farmers recognized the qualities of this new variant and figured out that the only way to keep the supply coming was by grafting, grafting branches of this tree onto other trees. Farmers lopped off the top of pistachio tree with the undesirable fruit and then lashed a branch from one of the tasty nuts into a severed trunk. The next step was to wait as the tree needed to gather the vascular systems of the trunk or rootstock and branch scion. It is impossible to know how and where the first idea of grafting arose. Perhaps it was through trial and error, as many things. Or perhaps people were emulating something that they saw in nature. Very interesting theory, this. It seems like sometimes it happens that trees that grow together close enough, close to each other, um, they seem to graft. And then two, two trees merge into one. So the ingenuity here lies in uh, the farmers realizing that grafting was a way to have more trees with the same nut, or basically, as we can put it another way, um, to lock 
this variety in place. Evidence so far points to farmers having domesticated the pistachio during the first millennium BCE, and that was somewhere within its wild range, which is today's Central Asia, what we call Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, as well as the northern Iran and northern Afghanistan. Over the centuries after the first cultivations, as they cultivated and developed what, in, what we now call Pistachia vera into a local cash crop, merchants disseminated through markets along the Silk Road trade routes. By the first century CE, the Greek physician Dioscorides was proclaiming this nut as a remedy for stomach ailments in his De Materia Medica. By the 7th century, Silk Road pistachios had funds all the way to India and China. Jump a couple of centuries later, and the Sogdian scholar Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Jafar Narsaki, in his 943 CE History of Bukhara, describes bazaars devoted solely to pistachios and tradesmen who specialized in selling these nuts. But even then, it seems like cultivation of the pistachio was not um, extremely widespread. Today, the pistachio, or pistachia vera, a small tree of the cashew family, and its edible seeds is grown in dry lands in warm or temperate climates. It is widely cultivated from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean region and in California. The seed kernels can be eaten fresh or roasted and are commonly used in a variety of desserts including baklava, halva and ice cream. They are also used for its yellowish-green coloring in confections. From its presumed center of origin, pistachio cultivation was extended within the ancient Persian Empire from where it gradually expanded westward. And the name pistachio probably derives from the word pistak in the ancient Persian language. Pistachio nuts are also mentioned in the Bible as precious gifts carried from Canaan to Egypt by the sons of Jacob. Pistachio cultivation spread into the Mediterranean countries with the advent of the Roman Empire. The ancient Greek uh, botanist Theophrastus describes the pistachia as um, a tree that comes from India, and it looks like the timber tree on his uh, branches and leaves, aside from the seeds it's themselves, who look like almonds. And this is a tree that grows in Bactria as well. Aristobulus, too, a historian who went on Alexander's exp- expedition, described this important tree, and naturally enough, also described it as a terebinth. That was the best he could do for. Um, Simply, in ancient Greek, there was no name for the pistachio tree yet. But the poet Nicander, a century after Theophrastus and Aristobulus, refers to the pistachio in language which is pretty close to Theophrastus, but he gives it a name. All the pistachios that grow like almonds on their branches, beside the Indian flood of the resounding Hoaspis. By that time, the pistachio was actually grown in Arabia and Syria, as well as further east. According to Pliny, the pistachio tree was first brought to Italy by Vitellius, father of the emperor, who served in the Levant between 35 and 39 AD. The pistachio is propagated by grafting, as we said. And as it spread in the Mediterranean, in Mediterranean lands, it may well have been grafted more often on already thriving terebith trees, as it still is true in Turkey. From Aristobulus, again, we have the following passage. Alexander crossed the mountains to Bactria by ways barren, but for a little shrubby tebe- but for a little shrubby terebinth, so short of wood that the flesh of beasts was eaten, and so short of wood that it was eaten raw. But with the raw meat, the digestive was sylphion, which grew plentifully. Today, world-renowned um, pistachios are the Sicilian ones uh, from the magical black volcanic soil of the land. The small Sicilian town of Bronte grow some of the best ones. Along all scars on the earth's surface, made from lava flows and between lava stones, bronze pistachios grow at the feet of the mythical and active volcano of Etna. This landscape makes it impossible to use any kind of machinery. Man does all the work here, like they did thousands of years ago. Sicily had many conquerors over its uh, long history, and it was the Arabs who conquered Sicily in the Middle Ages and began the extensive cultivation of uh, pistachio trees here. Pistachios are called fastuka in the Brode dialect, a term derived from the old Arab word. By the 1500s, Bronte was a flourishing pistachio trade hub, 
luring merchants from across Italy. In the town they call it Green Gold, and for a reason. Bronde means thunder, and it's the name of one of the cyclops who, who forged the lighting of Zeus in Hephaestus forges under Etna. The Grotta di Bronte is one of the caves where dwarf elephants used to go and die during the period they inhabited Sicily, and tusks from this time have been discovered there. The enormous nasal hole of the trunk was mistaken for the eye of a cyclops, and thus was born the legend of the cyclops in Sicily. However, the elephant never had a chance to try the pistachios. As we said, obviously, the elephants lived in prehistoric times, long before, um, obviously, humans arrived. The Arabs, who introduced pistachio in the lands of Sicily, they brought other exquisite Middle Eastern plants, such as sugarcane and citrus fruits. The green gold, or frastuca, as it used to be called when it was, when it was used as a medicine, it's truly emerald in color. It has an incomparable flavor and aroma and produces unique ice creams, custards, sweet and salty sauces, and desserts. It's incredibly adaptable and it has a delicate balance between sweet and savory. And this is from the, from the Broder Pistachio website. Because of the steep, impassable environment and the danger that uh, the fruit would be dispersed among the volcanic rocks, the labor involved in harvesting is expensive and it's still done, as I said earlier, entirely by hand either by making the fruit fall from the trees straight into a container carried on the shoulder of the person under the tree, or by shaking the branches and collecting the pistachios or cloths stretched out beneath the plants. In some cases, an upturned umbrella is used. This highly prized emerald is unique if it grows out of the rock. Popular cakes include pistachio little horn cornetti, shaped like croissants and served at breakfast. Iris, a fried bun covered in pistachio crumbs and filled with pistachio cream, and filetta, a saucer-shaped pistachio brioche. Each year, in Rafadali, another pistachio-growing township in Sicily, known for its Arab-style architecture, holds its picturesque Fastuca Fest, which is with cooking exhibitions and tastings of local treats as pistachio meatballs and sweet couscous made with grated pistachios, candied fruits and almonds. Raffadali specialty cakes include curly-shaped green pistachio, rich biscuits, pistachio-filled tube-shaped cannoli pastries, and pies filled with, with a blend of cream pistachio and ricotta chips milk cheese. And here is a <laughs> very interesting fact about pistachios. Exploding pistachios. It seems like without any regard to our sanity and logic, pistachios sometimes burst into flames. Like so many other delicious things, one of the secrets behind pistachio's tastiness is the high fat levels. The nut is probably about 45-55% to 55% fat and has a low water content, and hence fat burns incredibly well. The fat cleaving enzymes are activated by the elevated water content. This means that the fat decomposes when the nut becomes moist, adding more flammable factors like extra carbon dioxide and heat into the mix. So if you have lots of pistachios in one place, um, and they can be, they will have heavy weight and pressure that creates ideal conditions f to burst into flames. But yeah, you need a lot, a lot of pistachios. It's not going to happen with one bag of pistachios that are extra dry. It needs a bit of moisture as well and a lot, a lot of weight. In Greece, famous are the Aegina pistachios, which are which were from the island of Aegina uh, in the Saronic Gulf, south uh, west of uh, Athens and Attica. And they were brought there uh, by the Dr. Nikolaos Peroglu in 1896. In 1916, he had um, published a book for the cultivation of a pistachio tree, and uh, he he wanted to and he wanted to spread the cultivation of pistachio. So he managed to convince the Guinean farmers to plant pistachios. He uh, spread uh, um, grafting branches for people to use. And wherever he was making a present to people, he was making a present of a, pista of a small pistachio tree. Two of these uh, little presents, they still exist in the city of Aegina. If you ever go to Greece, try, try them. They're really tasty ones. As we said, um, in ancient Greek, um, Nicander or... Um, Nicander was uh, the first who named the tree Pistachia, 
or pistachio, as we say it in English. And um, the um, word comes from the ancient Persian word pista, which probably means um, the nut or the tree. And from that root, uh, from that word, all the naming of um, the Western languages of pistachio. So we have pistachio in French, pistachio in English, pistaka in Russian, fustuk in Arabic. I'll be back after this short break. Here I would like to mention a little bit about uh, the peanut as well. An honorable mention to the peanuts because um, it's uh, another very interesting legume this time, not um, not a nut per se. And it's one of the most traveled foods coming from the new world and that uh, says something. Imagine, of course, we have chilies and potatoes, which are very traveled too. But it's difficult to overstate the role of peanuts in traditional world cuisines and the health of the people who ate it. Satais and sauces and cookies and stir fries with peanuts, sweets and confections, salads and greens mixed with peanuts. The list of peanut dishes is a long and rich one. According to the website alwayspt.org, it is health that drove the peanut to be a building block of healthy traditional diets. Throughout centuries, legumes have been an essential component of traditional diets. While peanuts are botanically legumes, from a culinary perspective, they are used like nuts. This connection between the two is close. Legumes and nuts share very important characteristics. The first one is the ability to store without refrigeration. Therefore, they can be consumed after some time and provide calories and nourishment throughout the year. They share another property in that they both contain a good amount of protein, something that they also have in common with animal products. Of course, the interesting thing here with a peanut, the most traveled nut in the world, is that is it to mistake it is it to mistake that originated in Africa because of the peanut's connection with the, with the slave trade? As I mentioned, the truth is that it's a new world food, South American in fact, most likely from Bolivia or Peru. And peanuts were brought to Africa by Portuguese slave traders, unfortunately, and their popularity spread there slowly. Uh, Culinary historian Jessica Harris reports that uh, the Mandika of Western African still remember this and refer to the legume as tiga, a diminutive of the Portuguese word mandega, meaning butter, which perhaps has connotations of... uh, the oil of the peanut, which was used for cooking. So throughout the centuries, the Africans recognized uh, the incredible nutrition potential of this new food, which is 26% protein by weight. Uh, Plus, the plant, as all the legumes do, uh, enriches the soil with nitrogen. So the peanut became the plant with the highest protein yield per acre. Besides being a major source of nutrition, the taste of peanuts became central to the West African cooking. And peanuts could be eaten toasted as a nut or consumed raw like other legumes. Raw peanuts were boiled much like dried peas and served as a side dish. In Ghana and Nigeria, peanuts were cooked together with dried corn and made into flour and peanut butter. From there, the peanuts traveled back forward to Brazil and it was reintroduced to the northeastern Brazil by by African slaves. Often cooked with okra, it was made into stews. Similarly, the peanut traveled to the US with African slaves who cultivated and cooked it in the plantations of the southern states. From the time of the Civil War, it spread through America. Then a scientist at Tuskegee Institute named George Washington Carver became a passionate advocate of the peanut, producing a peanut cookbook with 105 ways of preparing the peanuts. Carver is a very interesting um, character. He was born into slavery in Diamond Grove, now Diamond, Newton County, Missouri, near Crystal Place, sometime in the early 1860s. Obviously, we have sketchy records of uh, slaves' births and their background. His father Giles died before George was born, and when he was one week old, he, his sister and his mother were kidnapped by night raiders from Arkansas. George's brother James was rushed to safety from the kidnappers. The kidnappers sold the trio in Kentucky. Moses Carver, the the plantation owner and owner of the slaves, uh, hired John Bentley to find them, but he only found uh, the infant George. So Moses negotiated with the raiders to gain the boy's return and rewarded Bentley. After slavery was abolished, Moses Carver and his wife, Susan, raised George 
and his older brother James as their own children. They encouraged George to continue his intellectual pursuits, and uh, so Aunt Susan taught him the basics of reading and writing. In early 1888, Carver obtained $300 uh, loan from the Bank of Ness City for education. By June, he left the area. In 1890, Carver started studying art and piano at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa. His art teacher, Etta Budd, recognized Carver's talent for painting flowers and plants. She encouraged him to study botany at Iowa State Agricultural College in Amis. When he began there in 1891, he was the first black student at Iowa State. Carver's bachelor's thesis for a degree in agriculture was Plants as Modified by Man, dated 1894. Iowa State University professors Joseph Budd and Louis Pamel convinced Carver to continue there for his master's degree. Carver did research at the Iowa Experiment Station under Pamel during the next two years. His work at the Experiment Station in Plant Pathology and Mycology first gained him national recognition and respect as a botanist. Carver received his Master's of Science degree in 1896. Carver taught as the first black faculty member of Iowa State. He developed techniques to improve soils depleted by repeated plantings of cotton. Together with other agricultural experts, he urged farmers, especially black farmers, to restore nitrogen to the soils by practicing systematic crop rotation, alternating cotton crops with planting of sweet potatoes or legumes such as peanuts, soybeans and cowpeas. These crops both restored nitrogen to the soil and were good for human consumption. He was an amazing character. Um, if you want to Google his name and find out more, he's a genius. George Washington Carver. Anyway, back to our peanuts. And uh, let's end our story. From there, so how did the peanut travel to the east, to Asia? We have the first mentions of uh, peanut in China as early as 1530. So just a tiny bit after its discovery in the Americas. It was the Spanish and Portuguese again who brought the peanut east. They were obviously spice traders and missionaries. The Spanish took it to the Philippines and the Portuguese to India and Macau. And from there it traveled throughout China via, via returning Chinese traders. The peanut was widely accepted. The Chinese already loved legumes and nuts in general anyway. And they used it to make sauces and used it and use the peanuts as oils to make oils. And this is it. This is our short history of pistachio tree and the bonus short history of the peanut. And for the extra bit for Patreon backers only, I have a recipe of tuna in a pistachio and sesame crust with sweet pickled peppers, plus a sweet recipe using pistachios. So this is a recipe for four portions for four people. So get uh, four tuna steaks, roughly 250 grams each or nine ounces, 80 grams of pistachios, plus some extra to serve. Served, of course, the weight, about 10 kilos. And resist them until they cool down before eating. Enjoy! <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode. Take care, be well, and see you soon for another archaeogastronomical adventure.